Check, check.
morning, everybody. Glad to see a lot of faces in the room t- or in the sanctuary tonight. Or t- this morning, my bad. <laughs> a long weekend or a long week, you know. Um, well, yeah, blessed to see a lot of new faces. So welcome for, to the newcomers. And for those that are joining us for the first time virtually, we welcome you as well. We're blessed to have you guys join us for our morning service. Um, so as usual, I will start with announcements for the week. The BEST program, the Biblical Exposition of Systematic Theology, will continue this Wednesday and every Wednesday at 8 p.m. The Zoom link will be posted on Facebook and an in-person option is available. So please sign up or contact Pastor DC for that. Again, we will have membership class on March 27th. So this is our first membership class as an EC congregation. So yay for that. (laughs) <laughs> um, so for those that have not signed up, please do if you are interested. Um, the reps took it, and it was, it was a blessing to take it with Pastor DC and taking it as an EC um, ourselves. Um, we will have the, oh, I guess that last slide, okay, nope. All right, that is all for announcements this morning. So before service, we do do a call to worship, so I invite everyone, if you're willing and able, to please stand and join us in reciting from Ephesians 2 and the Lord's Prayer this morning. And you were dead in your fences and sins. Among them we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the rest. Even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ, by the grace you have been saved. So that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. Um, So at this time, I want to also meditate on what we just read in Ephesians. Um, And in relation to the season of Lent that we are practicing, um, we're just a week or a little bit over a week from celebrating Christ's death and also celebrating His resurrection. So as we just read in Ephesians, um, let's remind ourselves of what Christ did, what Christ confirmed through the cross, that in the midst of our transgressions, that in the midst of our wrongdoings, that Christ had us in mind, that He so desired the ages to come where we could once again walk with Him, we could once again have perfect union and fellowship with Him, and that He would endure the cross because of that. So let's remind ourselves of that this morning in prayer and meditation. the Lord's Prayer. Our 
Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever.
remind ourselves of our identity that is found in Christ that our Father and our Savior has not forsaken us and that he has declared sonship and daughtership over each and every one of us that he has authority even over our death and that he promises eternal life for those that believe and obey so let's pray over that identity on each and every one of us this morning whether there has been doubt in our hearts whether our time in this age that we live in has been marked with a lot of suffering even in this period of time where there is so much racial tension there's so much hurt there's so much hurting between brothers and sisters but 
that Christ and that God, our Father, He has not forsaken us, that He has shown us what true love looks like. So pray over that identity on yourself and those around you. We are not forsaken as a creation. We are not forsaken as sons and daughters. But Christ has confirmed his promises and his covenants through his death and through his resurrection that we will celebrate in the upcoming weeks. So let's pray over that this morning. chosen, not forsaken, as I am who you say I am, as you are for me, not against me, as I am who you say I am, as I am chosen, not forsaken, as I am who you say I am, as you are for me not against me is I am who you say I am yes I am who you say I am oh I am who you say I am whom the sun sets free oh is free indeed is I'm a child of My father's house is there's a place for me is I'm a child of God yes I am so now is a time for giving of offerings and tithes and so those that have joined us physically we have an offering basket in the front. If you're willing and able, to please present your offering to the Lord here. For those that are joining us virtually, um, we have an offering link to give virtually in our YouTube page and also in our website. So if you are willing and able, please present your offering and tithes to the Lord there. Dance over me as you dance over me. It's while I am away. As you sing all around. It's but I never hear the sound.
I'm amazed. Yes, Lord, I'm amazed by you. Yes, Lord, I'm amazed by you. Yes, Lord, I'm amazed by you. Yes, Gracious Heavenly Father, Abba, we praise you, we glorify you, and we thank you for this blessed time as the body gathers to worship our one true risen Savior and King, Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to welcome our dear brother JT and our dear sister Lauren. Thank you for guiding them to our church. You know their needs. You know their desires. And so won't you build up their vertical relationship with you? And I pray that as they fall deeper in love with you, they will go out into this world to share your love with those around us. And if our church can be the church where they can grow vertically and horizontally in their faith and in their love, I pray that you will grant them peace and joy. So we welcome them this morning. We welcome all of our guests who are joining us online. We welcome everybody who will be joining us later through the recording. God, you are a God who knows every single individual and soul. So won't you be their God as well? And Lord, we pray that you would use this offering that we have given up to you to build up your church, to build up your kingdom. And God, I pray that as we give, we would also give our lives, our souls, our thoughts, everything that we have. For you first gave it up all for us in your son, Jesus. And God, lastly, with heaviness in our hearts, we remember those whose lives were lost this past week. We remember Pak Sun Chung. Kim Hyun Jung, Kim Soon Cha, Yu Young E, Delena, Ashley Yon, Paul Andre Michels, Zhao J Tan, and Dao Yu Feng. God, we mourn as a people, and there are those who are grieving the loss of their lo loved ones to senseless hatred and anger. And God, we live in a time where sometimes, Lord, it's too much. It's too much. We are tired. We are heavy laden. We are burdened. There's so much hate that we don't even know how to begin to process it. We cry out for help. We just simply ask, may there be an end that, Lord, that Asian lives would matter, that black lives would matter, that unborn lives would matter, that lives would simply matter. And yet even that, is faced with opposition. So in a time when faithlessness is running rampant, I pray that your faithfulness will shine all the more. That when we want to give up hope and we want to turn to the ways of the world, I pray that you would be our hope and that you would show us that this is temporary and that eternity is coming. So until that day comes, help us to persevere. May we be agents of spirit and truth and light. And I pray that we will be messengers of the gospel, not just in speech, but also in action. And God, that you will give us wisdom and discernment to navigate these tumultuous times. And that, Lord, your light will first shine to us. And then that light will shine through us. So now we humbly ask your will be done and not ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Thank you all so much for joining us for service. We're going to keep the front lights off today. We've had some uh, light flickering issues. So to help you all focus and not to make some of us go crazy, we'll keep it off in the front. But it's okay because 
We may be dark here, but we have the brilliant light of Jesus Christ shining in and through us. And this is when you can smile at how cheesy I can be and relate all things back to Jesus Christ. All right. With that being said, we do want to once again welcome JT and Lauren. They're sitting right here in the middle row. JT and Lauren, if you can just raise your hand for us. Let's welcome them to our church. Thank you so much for joining us. We've also had uh, Kiwan and Lucia return safely from their honeymoon trip. So welcome back, Kiwan and Lucia. And don't worry, everybody else, you're a welcome back as well. So thank you for being here with us. Oh, yeah, we can. All right. With that being said, oh, I'm, I'm struggling, church. I'm just going to be real with you. I am struggling. I am angry, frustrated, appalled, disgusted. Just so many things are going through my mind, my heart, my soul. I've had to take a break from some social media this past week just with everything that's been going on. Ugh, and I'm just, I'm heavy. And so I'm going to just trust this time to the Lord. And I'm going to ask that God is the one who speaks as he always speaks. And that I will take the background as Christ and the Holy Spirit take the front and the center stage to lead us closer to the Father. So with that, as we continue in our series through the Gospel of Mark, last week we saw how the nameless anonymous woman poured out the entire alabaster jar full of pure nard to anoint Jesus. How she did not hold back an entire year's worth of wages to prepare Jesus for his impending crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And so we pick up this Sunday in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. And Mark actually brings close attention to something that he has yet to do in the first 13 chapters of his gospel account. And that is to show time sequences. Up until now, time has not been of extreme importance in how Mark has revealed the gospel of Jesus Christ. But all of a sudden, when we get to verse 14, chapter 14, verse 17, he says, evening, which is shown through the Lord's Supper, verses 37 through 41, midnight, which is shown through Gethsemane and Jesus' arrest, and then the rooster crowing as dawn is about to break in verse 68 and 72 to mark the beginning of Jesus' trial, Peter's denial, and then early morning in chapter 15, verse 1, as the crucifixion complex begins. And so whenever Mark is doing something with the way he's writing, including the Mark and sandwiches and the time sequence narrative right now, he's making us become hyper alert and focused because he's doing something, especially when it comes to compare and contrast. And today we get to see that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the positive example of faithfulness, while the disciples are the counter to Jesus' faithfulness by being the negative example of fleshiness. So Jesus will show us the positive example of faithfulness while the disciples will counter that with their negative example of fleshiness. Jesus succeeds where the disciples fail. And that is still true today as when we fail, God will always prevail. And so let's get into this. It won't be a prototypical sermon. I won't have point one, two, three for you all. You all have taken your SATs or been done with that. I'm sorry if it triggered some bad memories of high school. But I know you can handle a sermon without direct points. So we're going to go through the narrative, and I'm going to pause here and there to explore and excavate what Mark is doing with the text that he's writing to the audience back then to make it relevant for us now and how we can learn to be a disciple like Jesus was. Because our mission at Bethany English Congregation is to be a disciple and make disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself perfectly exemplifies that in Mark 14, 12 through 52, as he first shows us what it means to be a disciple. And then will show us and his disciples what it means to go make disciples. So let's begin in verse 12 of Mark 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And on the first day of unleavened bread... When they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? So let me pause here and explain what the Passover is. It dates all the way back to when the Israelites, the Hebrew nation, were under the tyranny and rule of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. 
And as God sent Moses and Aaron to let his people go, Pharaoh kept hardening his heart and refused to give them their freedom. So God counteracted the acts of the Egyptian gods by bringing up plagues that were outside of their control and could only be brought upon the Lord and the creator of this universe. And then it finally, unfortunately, spiraled to the final plague of the death of firstborns. Both for families and for animals. And God instructed the Israelites to give up a sacrifice, to give an offering, and to take the blood of that sacrifice and brush it on the two doorposts and the lintel that's on top to mark that they had offered up a sacrifice pleasing, pleasing to the Lord. And so when the Spirit would come to take the life of the firstborn as the plague, when they would see that the blood had been offered, sacrifice had been made, they would literally pass over and spare the life of the Israelite people. And so this is what they're celebrating, also remembering how God led the Israelites faithfully from Egypt in that Exodus account. And as Jesus honored the Passover with his disciples, it was in preparation for when it was the only son, Jesus' time to be offered as a sacrifice, the father would not this time pass over but would take the offering of his son to be the final sacrifice for the sins of the world. And the ironic situation of this account, we can pick up back in verse 13, is that it says, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Usually, back in those days, it was women who carried jars of water. And so the fact that it was a man that would be carrying this jar of water was extremely culturally ironic. And yet Jesus was very specific, a man carrying a jar of water. And it was even so that it wasn't the disciples who ended up finding the man, it was the man who ended up finding the disciples, showing his attitude and readiness to lead them to enjoy the Passover as the Lord's final supper. And as soon as he heard that the teacher had sent them, he was willingly ready to go and show the disciples the way. Already a nobody, a stranger, just carrying a jar of water is more obedient than the 12 that had been with Jesus up until this point. Verse 17, and when it was evening, notice that time stamp, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So let me begin excavating this text by what we just read in verse 25. The drink of the fruit of the vine is signifying the first drink, which will be the divine punishment of God against sin. And that drink would signify the end of the curse that was brought on when Adam disobeyed and ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil back in the garden of Eden. And the second drink that he's talking about that will be new in the kingdom of God is to signify the end of that curse and the beginning of eternity as he would usher in the new Jerusalem, the new heaven and the new earth where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more sin. But the first must come to pass for the second to come later on. And as Jesus is beginning this Last Supper discourse with his disciples, if you've noticed, it begins and ends with truly. It begins and ends with truly. In the Greek, truly is amen. Does that sound familiar? The word that we use for amen means truly. I agree. And so Jesus is saying in verse 18, truly I say to you, 
and he bookends it in verse 25, truly I say to you. And the reason why Jesus is saying amen, amen, is because he knows that God is in control. God is truth, and what is about to transpire through the crucifixion account has been brought on by no one but the Lord himself. For this is the plan of action that was sprung into motion the moment Adam disobeyed in the Garden of Eden, and now it's about to come to its ultimate climax as Jesus would be hung on a cross for sins that were not his to bear, but that was ours. And as much as I want to gloss over this portion, the Judas predicament raises another question. If God predestined Judas to be the betrayer, doesn't that mean that Judas didn't have a choice? That sounds highly unfair. And this is one of the questions I get frequently. If God, if Judas was predestined to betray Jesus, how did he have a chance? How was it even fair for him? Because he was born ultimately to betray. How do you explain that, Pastor? While God knew what Judas would do, Judas himself didn't know. God knew what Judas was going to do, but Judas Judas himself didn't know. If anything, Jesus, while fully knowing that Judas, one of the 12, would ultimately betray him, still gave Judas a number of chances. Judas was called to be a part of the 12 inner circle of disciples, was he not? Jesus gave him that chance. Eat with me, do ministry with me, travel with me, watch miracles, and see my compassionate heart, and see that treasure is not in coins, is not on this earth, but the true treasure of the kingdom of God lies in heaven. So he's saying, Judas, let's go. Let's go together, walk with me. But that wasn't enough. Ultimately, Judas betrayed, not because he was chosen, but because he chose to betray Jesus. Judas betrayed not because he was chosen, but because he himself chose to betray Jesus. And what can even see the last supper as Judas's last chance and opportunity to not go through with his betrayal? But unfortunately, as we saw last week, while the nameless woman gave her all to ready Jesus, Judas sold out Jesus for but a few coins. Verse 19 They began to be sorrowful and say to him after one another, is it I? The way the Greek is written here in the original language is asking, surely not I, Jesus? Surely it won't be me that betrays you. Surely I will follow you to the end. And unfortunately, their self-confident response would betray them. For in the end, not just one, but all of them would fall away. And yet, even in the midst of these final hours with his disciples, who would ultimately flake out, Jesus still chose to break bread and drink wine and share with them the crucifixion and the hope of the resurrection. Man, if I knew somebody was going to hurt me, if I knew somebody was going to go behind my back and gossip, if I knew somebody was going to purposefully misunderstand my good intentions, would I still do good to them? I'll be honest, as your pastor, I would struggle. I would struggle. And yet, Jesus, this is what set him apart. He still chose to teach and to serve his disciples while fully being aware all of them would abandon him. And yet, surely, Peter, wouldn't he be different? We're talking about the Peter. We're talking about the rock Peter. We're talking about the only human being to have ever walked on water apart from Jesus. Come on, Peter. Be that alpha disciple. Be that confident disciple that steps up. Verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, even though they all, the other 11 fall away, I will not. So this is where in the movie, everybody's clapping. Let's go, Peter. That's right. Come on, be that disciple, right? Unfortunately, Peter's bold proclamation amounted to nothing but lip service. As Jesus went on to predict in the next verse, in verse 30, Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. In the words of Brady, Not Tom Brady, but another commentator, Brady, in the Bible. This very night, before a rooster has raised its voice twice to witness its wakefulness to approaching dawn, you, Peter, will raise your voice, 
not merely twice, but three times. And not to witness to your wakefulness, but to witness to the wakelessness of your allegiance to me. Verse 31, but he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. They all missed the point. They all missed the point. They failed to realize the source of Jesus' confidence. Jesus wasn't confident in himself. We'll see later on in his prayer. No, his confidence wasn't in himself, but it was in the Father God Almighty, for he knew that God knew what was best and what needed to take place for the salvation of this world, not to go through Noah 2.0 all over again. And yet, failing to learn, failing to observe, and failing to apprehend, the disciples continued to place their confidence in who? Themselves. I will not fall away. I will not mess up. They will, but I will not. And their misplaced confidence in themselves is painstakingly highlighted in the immediate verses in verse 32. And when they, and they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. That's it. In Jesus' final hours before betrayal, what did, did Jesus say, hey, go run some laps? I want you to go save some lives. I want you to go to cure cancer. No, he says, sit here while I pray. Is that too much to ask? Verse 33, and he took with him Peter, James, and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Remain here and watch. In another gospel author's account, in the account of Luke, Jesus actually goes through something called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is being so overwhelmed and stressed to the point where your blood vessels burst, mix in, mixes in with your sweat glands, and you are so overwhelmed with agony that you begin to sweat out blood. It's an actual medical condition. To that degree is the degree in which Jesus was troubled and sorrowful. Why, though? Is he doubting God? Is he questioning God's plan? Absolutely not. Here's the reason why Jesus was distressed and troubled. He was distressed and troubled because he was about to bear the full wrath of the Father by facing his wrath against sin. Jesus was about to become the very thing that he himself hates and cannot stand, sin itself. And number two, Jesus was distressed and troubled because he was about to experience separation from the Father. Before God even created time, he was, he is, and he forever will be. And that very Jesus, part of the perfect triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, was about to experience separation for the first time and the last time in eternity. In the words of my mentor and preaching professor, Dr. Cruvilla, whom I call Dr. K., he writes, more agonizing than the physical torment will be the abandonment of him by the Father as he faces the judgment of God upon sin, being made sin for mankind and becoming a curse for humans. This is why Jesus was distressed and sorrowful, even to the point of hematidrosis as we sweat out blood. Let's continue in verse 35. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground. Jesus literally fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is the true prayer of a true disciple. We ask God what we want to ask. We make our petitions, we make our requests, we make our pleas, we beg God, and yet at the end of our prayers, every disciple who follows Jesus should pray, God, not my will, but your will be done. Not my way, but your way. That is how we surrender to the Lord. Verse 37, and he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Peter, Peter, you just said that you were willing to die for Jesus. Bro, you can't even stay awake for him for an hour. Same with you, James and John. All of you, I will never, I will never run away from you, Jesus. I will never, you know, betray you. No, you can't even stay awake. Jesus' three sessions of prayer are counterbalanced by his three disciples failing to stay awake and falling asleep three times. Jesus succeeded three times where the disciples failed three times. Jesus is the faithful counterpart to the failing disciples. Here's what we can take away from this. Jesus didn't come just to make disciples. He also came to exemplify what it means to be a disciple. That's utmost respect and honor. Jesus didn't just come to tell us what to do. He did it first. Verse 43. And immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and from the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Talking about Peter, let me talk about him one more time. Peter boasted too much, prayed too little, and acted violently too quickly. This is the fleshiness of disciples and how they fail. Boasting too much, praying too little, and acting violently too quickly. When juxtaposed to Jesus' faithfulness as he loved, served, and gave his life to the end. Which do you think is the true paradigm of what it means to be a disciple? The disciples allowed their flesh to rule while Jesus allowed his faith to reign. And then we get to a peculiar final two verses in verse 51 and 52. So peculiar that I was tempted to just skip it and leave it out. Verse 51, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth of, about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. What in the world? Who? First of all, brother, wear some clothes. Like, who are you trying to tempt out here, like, wearing a, nothing but a white linen cloth, trying to follow Jesus, and then all of a sudden you're seized and you run away naked? How do you reconcile such a text in the midst of Jesus' hour of betrayal? At first glance, 51, 52 come out of nowhere. It's like a blindsiding us, right? And yet, in the words of Dr. K, the young man is best interpreted as one whose flight an abandonment of his linen cloth contrasts dramatically with Jesus' obedience in submitting to being arrested, stripped, and crucified. This naked man willingly gave up his clothing to run away from Jesus while Jesus submitted to the point of death, being stripped of his robe. This last disciple in verse 51 and 52 who at first sought to follow Jesus, ultimately left everything to get away from Jesus. This last disciple is symbolic of all the other disciples who just ran away. Because if you go back to when the first disciples were called, they left everything. They left their profession, they left their nets, they left their fishing boats, they left their families. They gave up everything to follow Jesus. And yet here we are now, where they would leave everything to run away from Jesus. Naked and ashamed, the disciples have abandoned their Savior. Church, how Mark portrays the failures of the disciples here in this text, who were with Jesus, is not any different 
with the modern day disciples who call themselves Christians. This story of the naked disciple running away in shame is our very own story. How many of us ran to Jesus asking for forgiveness, crying our hearts out? Many of us who grew up in the Asian American church on the last night where the cup of was delicious but where the prayers were even better with the Lord as we're going all out saying one way or whatever song it was at that time, at that retreat, jumping up and down, being humbled in prayer saying, Jesus, I believe that you are my Lord and Savior. That was then. Where are we now? We put Jesus at the front of everything and yet how many of us are now treating Jesus as the back burner? This portrays the failures of the disciples, but it also portrays that Jesus, even in his final hours, pre-betrayal and pre-crucifixion, showed absolute trust in God and prayed desperately and dependently. Jesus was never independent of God. He was always dependent on him. While the disciples relied on their own capacity, failed to be alert, and bore the shame of their betrayal. If we are to be woke like Jesus, avoid spiritual slumber, and flee lackadaisical faith, which is running too rampant in the modern-day church and amongst modern-day Christians and disciples, we must be faithful and trusting God through desperate prayer. We must be faithful and trusting God through desperate prayer. It was a dark time. The day Jesus was hung on a criminal's cross for the sins of the world, just as it is a dark time now, as we face racism, sexual immorality, deceit, and pride running rampant. Church, I'm not shocked at xenophobia. I'm not surprised that racism still exists. It has existed long before history books were even written about racism. What I am shocked is by how celebrated racism is and the sheer magnitude of denial and the spitting in the face of those who are suffering from racism. During a news conference this past week, Cherokee County Sheriff's Captain Jay Baker casually explained and almost sounded like as if he was defending and excusing the shooter by saying he was having a really bad day. And this is what he did. I'm sorry. If that was any person of color, such luxury would have never been given to the shooter. And I'm sorry. The last time I had a really bad day, you know what I did? On a really, really bad day, I went to go eat Andy's ice cream to make myself feel better. I went to go eat good food to feel to say on a really bad day, you go on a killing spree, I'm about to flip this podium over. The anger, the disbelief, the sheer wrath that coursed through my veins as I sat through that news conference this week, grieving, lamenting, and mourning the loss of innocent lives, image bearers of God, and those who are in a position to protect the defenseless and to be a voice for the voiceless and to be an agent of justice, seemingly just saying it was a really bad day for it. Church, I'm hurting. I am absolutely furious and hurting. And it has been a difficult week. As I believe it has been for many of you. So what is the faithful response? What would Jesus do if he were here now with us on this earth? What is the gospel-centered, gospel-driven response? Be angry at sin and do not be sinfully angry. That's it. Be angry at sin and do not be sinfully angry. So let me give you some practical points on how to be both. Be angry at sin by being a voice and making yourself heard. We have far too long given to the model minority myth. How many of your parents told you, just put your head low. Don't get in trouble at school. Be a good 4.0 student. Just do this. Don't, don't get in trouble. 
then trouble won't come finding us. Where has that gotten us as a silent minority? Our black and brown brothers who have suffered for too many years came to a breaking point. We, as Asian American, majority Asian American or Pacific Islanders, must stand up for what is right and refuse to be silenced. Make your voice heard. Yes, on social media. That is one avenue to make your voice heard. But actually, I want more than just digital screen warriors. I don't want you to type up something on social media, but I want you to live it out. Be a voice in person with your neighbors. You have non-Asian, non-Pacific Islander neighbors, talk to them. Let them know how you are hurting and let them know what they can do to be a voice. It has broken my heart this past week. I, I share this often, but one of my favorite donut shops, Detour Donuts, whose owner I know, Ginny, who's a Korean-American woman, has been very vocal and has, and has made Stop Asian Hate Donuts. And can you imagine the phone calls that she got from privileged white people saying you need to stop white hate. Remember the illustration I used last week? Somebody's house is burning down and everybody's trying to help that neighbor and the neighbor whose house isn't affected comes into the conversation and says, what about my house? Does nobody care about me? That is like what it is like when you come into a conversation when a black brother or sister is hurting, they say black lives matter. And you come in and say, hey, you know what? All lives matter. Well, your house isn't burning. You don't have to fear the color of your skin. I heard a testimony from a white wife who was married to a black man that said whenever they go out for a couple spouse jog, she never lets her husband run behind her. Because in the optics of the public, when a stranger sees a black man running after a white woman, they automatically jump to conclusions. That is what racism looks like in modern day. For Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, the amount of hatred that has spiked ever since the coronavirus hit, to the unfortunate lack of wisdom from our former president calling it the Chinese virus, jokes like Kung Flu, that has directly hurt and that has brought people from out of the closet to be prideful in their arrogance against racism. I read another testimony written by a dear sister in Georgia who was getting to go dinner from a restaurant, walking to her car and a bunch of white men in a pickup truck pulled up and said, hey, can I get a massage? We must be angry at sin as God hates and is angry at sin. And we must make our voices heard online and in person. And we must take action and confront any acts of racism, microaggressions included. I've realized, do you know why my name is DC? It's because I got so tired of non-Koreans making fun of my name, Dongchun. What, what's your name? Dongchun? Did your parents drop chopsticks and that was a the sound they made when they gave birth to you? Traumatized in my own way by racism, I have conformed and said, just call me DC. The hurt is too real, church. And if we have any non-Asians joining us for service, if we have any non-Asians in our congregation, please, I'm not trying to push anybody out. I'm asking you in a way to help us Heal with us and hurt with us because we are hurting. We're not promoting white hate. We're just saying Asians are being hated right now. Black lives are not mattered right now. And we are in need of your help. So as we are angry at sin, how can we not be sinfully angry? This is where the gospel comes. Anybody can be angry at sin. Even non-believers can be angry at sin. But the gospel step is another extra step that we have to keep ourselves accountable. How do we become not sinfully angry? First, be compassionate. Be compassionate and reach out, especially to those who are of different skin color than you are. Listen to their stories and grieve with them. We have much to learn, especially from our black and brown sisters and brothers. I have talked to many. I have served on a panel 
where the majority of who came from hurt against racism and even church abuse were majority black women. And as a pastor, as a panelist in that Zoom seminar, it broke my heart that their voices had gone unheard for that long. Be compassionate and grieve with those who are grieving. Look deeply at your own souls. Have you been a racist yourself? Have you ever degraded, condescended, or looked down on anybody because they are different from your skin color? Have you ever considered, have you ever thought that Korean is the best Asian ethnicity? If these thoughts have ever crossed your mind, if you think that skin color and ethnic background sets you above or makes you any better by birth, you better watch out because that is exactly how the Holocaust happened. We must confront racism for what it is, but we must also confront the racism in our own hearts. That is the gospel-centered response, and we must genuinely repent. I don't know if it's unfortunately or fortunately for Captain Jay Baker, what he said has been now watched over a million times on different outlets. But I wonder, if there was a microscope documenting your life and the words that you spoke, how many sins can people call out against you? Look out against your own hearts. Also, church, we are taught to be strong and to not cry. It's okay to cry. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to lament. It's okay to suffer. It's okay to mourn and cry out to the Lord and ask him for healing and ask him for help. And remember, church, this is the beauty of the gospel. We have more in common with believers of different ethnic background than us than with non-believers of the same ethnicity. We have more in common with Christians who are black, brown, Hispanic, white, what European, doesn't matter. We have more in common with those Christians than we do with non-Christian Asian Americans because the gospel is stronger than ethnicity. The blood of Christ tore down the wall between Jew and Gentile, tore down the wall of any ethnic and language and cultural barrier to unite us as one body under one God who is precisely the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And one day when we get to eternity, when eternity comes down, when Jesus ushers in heaven and earth, there will be no more Korean Americans. There will be no more Chinese Americans. There will be no more white, black, brown. doesn't matter. Color will not be a thing because we will all be believers. We will all be Christians, worshiping Christ for eternity. So lastly, church, if you are down, if you have been down like me this past week, I have one final encouragement for you. John chapter 16, beginning in verse 28. John 16, verse 28, I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Verse 32, behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Amen. And just as the Father was with the Son, the Father is with his sons and daughters today. Verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. We will not have peace in this world, but we will have peace in Christ. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen? Let us be desperate in our dependence on the one who has overcome the world, and let us be desperate in prayer to the one who is able to answer all of our needs. Let's pray. God, the lives of eight image bearers were taken this past week and excuses have been made. This is the reality of our world. People are celebrating sin, they are proud of it, and they are excusing sin as sin instead of repenting and lamenting. Lord, we need you. We need your faith in a world where the majority are fleshy, help us to be a minority of faithfulness. God, we can't do it on our own. If we try to, if we try to be overconfident in ourselves, hatred will consume us, hopelessness and darkness will envelop us. 
But this is where we need the truth, the light of the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will raise up a generation of disciples who will be true disciples, who will refuse to give in to the ways of this world, and who will yet infuse the Holy Spirit into every second of our lives. And God, it's hard. I want to be angry. I want to flip over and I want to yell and I want to fight back. And yet, Jesus, you fought back on the cross by dying for our sins. So may the good news of the gospel, may the good news of Jesus Christ be what we fight back with. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment to be angry when we need to be angry and to be gracious when we need to be gracious. Come alongside of us, God, for we are hurting. As a majority Asian American church, we are hurting. But this is why all the more we want to be a church that is not known to be a Korean church, that is not known to be an Asian American church, but we want to be the church where all races, all ethnicities feel welcomed and loved through the goodness of the gospel. So may that vision come true. And I pray that Bethany English congregation will be a paradigm and an earthly reflection of the heavenly body of Christ. So God, we live our lives and we give it up into your hands and we ask that you will give us faith to do so. Your will be done and not ours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing, I need you. Cause I need you to soften my heart, to break me apart. I need you to pierce to the dark and cleanse every part of me. And so. Now may the amazing grace of our Lord and our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and the unfailing loving kindness of our Father God Almighty, the healing, the encouragement, and the hope and courage of the Holy Spirit empower and equip us to be genuine disciples and to make disciples and to overcome the hatred of this world through the power of the gospel now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
Thank you all so much for joining us for our service. Church, it's heavy and it's dark. And so please know, if you ever need prayer, if you ever need community, please reach out to us. Please reach out to me. We will be in prayer together and we will overcome because our Savior has overcome it all. Have a blessed week. Remember that God loves you. I love you all too. And let's spread his love to those around us. God bless.